I'm Char and I like splashing about in games. Today I'm wading into roguelike dungeon crawler The Nightmare Cooperative by Edinburgh based developers Lucky Frame. As with all my videos, there will be spoilers. There isn't a strong focus on narrative, but I'll pick that apart as much as I can, as well as discussing aspects like unlockable characters and overall level structure. There are a huge number of procedural dungeon crawls out there, and The Nightmare Cooperative is one of the more pared back examples. And that's kind of nice. It's tightly focused on simple but effective rules. The major gimmick here is controlling multiple characters at once, which makes the whole thing very puzzly. Each character has different abilities. The barbarian can push things around. The warrior gets a double attack. The archer shoots straight while the mages fire diagonally, and so on. Each game begins with two random characters, but you can have up to four at a time, and they all move and use abilities simultaneously, which makes it tricky to coordinate everyone around traps and enemies. Having more characters means more options, but also more complexity. Maybe it's better to sacrifice someone to keep moving, or maybe there's a way out of that. I find myself having to constantly remember this is turn-based, and that I can slow down and think things through doesn't help to panic and try to power through quickly. There are some really poor decisions in this game footage. On particular levels you can pick up new party members. Two of them will be sleeping on the ground and you bump into whichever character you want to take with you. The character you didn't choose disappears with a sad noise. It's like an even more ominous version of kids picking sports teams. And it's easy to develop favourites. Maybe you like to keep teams balanced, or maybe you prefer something more specialised. Do you want melee or ranged? If you enjoy more movement options, maybe you go for the ninja so you can sneak quickly past enemies, or the miner for breaking through walls. There's a political undercurrent to these choices, which makes me feel slightly awkward about them. The premise of the Nightmare Cooperative is that the village council has misused its money and is recruiting citizens to join the cooperative and head off in search of riches to pay back the council's loans. The characters in your party are described in a few simple lines, but it's just enough for a vague sense of their place in society. The mage is the only actual council member here, described as an old-fashioned centre-right politician. Presumably the mage believes in the Nightmare Cooperative and the Council's decisions, enough to put themselves in harm's way in pursuit of the Council's goals. By contrast, the warrior has some reservations. Maybe like the difference between joining the army from a highly patriotic family with proud military traditions, or joining because you need a job. What this game makes me think most about is the loss of power and individuality that come with joining the military but also that differences can't be completely erased. You agree to move in formation, to follow orders even when they will result in your death, and you're supposed to accept that it's in pursuit of a greater goal, that you can be proud of walking into that acid pit for the sake of your fellow soldiers and your village. People aren't numbers and I don't want to accept that trade-off. The real world equivalent is revolting to think of, but then I have the luxury of being idealistic. The archer feels homesick and the ninja has family waiting back home. The miner looks tough but feels fragile. Would he be able to adjust to living in normal society again? The barbarian, ice mage and astral walker experience prejudice and marginalisation. Will they be the first sacrifices in the name of the greater good? The priest has their religious views and the necromancer attempts to lobby for policy change and both become caught up in the council's current agenda before their own interests. As members of the Nightmare Cooperative, characters are reduced to their strategic value, but I wonder if I'm judging that accurately. I found myself avoiding the priest, despite the utility of healing magic. I could imagine the irritation at their attempts at spiritual guidance all too well. For a while I forgot what the Barbarian's special ability even was, and it was tempting to favour the straightforward and familiar damage of the default mage abilities over freezing enemies with ice magic, even though ice probably has more strategic potential. And this is part of why I roll my eyes whenever someone talks about hiring the best person for the job, as though that's an objective decision the people doing the hiring are always able to judge accurately. 
No one has to be trying to act unfairly for it to happen. The characters in the cooperative are sometimes described as friends, but it's difficult to imagine that would be true, except as something that arises out of being in this dangerous situation together, where cooperation is so critical. They're all part of such different worlds with different politics. A certain amount of difference between friends is a good thing, but some things can't be reconciled. The cooperative involves manipulated alliances, not genuine friendships. As the game's website advertises, perhaps you could form an uneasy alliance bound together by fear and a desperate desire to return home with bags and bags of beautiful gold for the village council, which takes such good care of your loved ones. It's just an idea. Just an idea framed with a subtly threatening edge. Friendship here is used as a marketing term. A recruitment tool along with promises of being a hero and doing good. Away from the marketing spiel and no one is really here to make friends and no one gets to be a big damn action hero saving the world. Everyone's a cog in a much bigger machine created for dubious reasons and working towards dubious goals. Over and over new recruits will enter the dungeon and most of them are never coming out again. The game's theme music is like a sad music box part fairy tale and part tragedy, with tinkly notes and the sound of a mechanism whirring and clunking in the background. Within the game itself, the music becomes more ambient and there's a heavier focus on sound effects, but it keeps the melancholy and music box feel. Each note passes slowly and with effort, as though the music box is starting to wind down. There's also a hiss or rattle every so often, which could be the mechanism, but also makes me think of dungeon creatures skittering. I began by describing the Nightmare Cooperative as a roguelike, and I think I'm pretty safe in this case, but I know some people get very worked up about the term, so let me be clear about that, just bear with me for a second. If I go with the Berlin interpretation of roguelikes, and you might not agree with it, it's not my favourite definition either, but if I go with the Berlin interpretation, as created at the International Roguelike Development Conference in 2008, the Nightmare Cooperative fits most of what it considers high-value criteria for defining a roguelike. I don't think arguing over the details of genre definition is even remotely interesting, but what can be interesting about looking at genre in this way is what it highlights about how designs influence each other and where they differ or develop over time. Using this framework, it's immediately obvious that the Nightmare Cooperative doesn't have the exploration and discovery of a more classic roguelike. The map is right there in front of you, and there's no need to identify items. The Nightmare Cooperative could be considered part of a subcategory of single-screen roguelikes, with condensed, somewhat board game or puzzle-like levels. There have been quite a few of these over the last few years. They work quite naturally as mobile or browser games, and a lot of them start out as really small projects like the 7-Day Roguelike Challenge including this one, the initial 7-day version of the Nightmare Cooperative is still freely available. The Nightmare Cooperative's most obvious inspiration is 868 Hack. Both games use a particularly small, square-based grid. 868 Hacks is a claustrophobic 6x6, whereas the Nightmare Cooperative has a bit more wiggle room at 9x9. But of course you also have multiple characters to coordinate. Most importantly, both games spawn more enemies or traps when you gather points, creating a constant trade-off between greed and danger. Particularly as roguelikes go, the Nightmare Cooperative is really accessible. The graphics are clear, friendly and attractive. Mousing over characters, enemies or items immediately tells you most of what you need to know about them. And everything has distinctive silhouettes and smart use of colour. Where a lot of the design of roguelikes and related genres is about gaining knowledge through experimentation, here the information is given up front and the challenge is in applying it. The overall dungeon structure contains four major sections, with four levels each. The introductory catacombs levels have predictable enemies with simple patrols. The ice caves introduce enemies that can freeze you, and snails create slippery trails that make characters slide around. They also include enemies that mirror your movements, adding an additional puzzle element in getting them out of your way or manipulating them into traps. 
The tech world includes a high density of turrets and switches to deactivate them temporarily. There are also these enemies that cause you to swap position with them, which is dangerous but can also be used to your advantage. The desert enemies are poisonous and present at high density, and it can feel like a final desperate fight to the end, with a narrow margin separating survival and death. And since only one character can make it to the end, sacrificing the others to make it through becomes even more likely. Each failure gives a simple graphic of how far through you made it, and how this compares to your best run. The goal is clearly in sight. But reaching the end of the dungeon doesn't come with any great fanfare, and it doesn't turn out well for the adventurers. Martial arts were banned and the ninja's family leaves. The mage lost their council position while they were away. The archer returns to her forest home, but has to live with the nightmares of what she's been through. The overall message is that it wasn't worth it. It's a fairly bog-standard dungeon, and the amount of gold that comes out is tiny as video game scores go. The usual approach is to make the numbers big so people feel good about it. The Nightmare Cooperative's small scores contribute to the intentional futility of it all. There are a few character unlocks. The Ice Mage and the Miner become available once you've collected special treasures that show up at the end of the Ice and Tech sections. Several of the characters require you to finish the game with particular criteria. Interestingly, unlocking the Necromancer requires you to complete the game below a certain score threshold, meaning there's an incentive to avoid treasure early on, and only go for high scores in later runs. Even then, when I think about it, the only obvious incentive to try for more gold is the high score table itself. These characters aren't even going to get to keep the loot, it's going to the village council, who are at best incompetent, but probably actively corrupt. It's hard to imagine why these characters would voluntarily sign up in the first place, let alone put themselves in more danger than absolutely necessary. But then, there's presumably a lot of pressure on them from somewhere. How much treasure you try for could certainly be framed in terms of how much loyalty, or fear, the council is able to command or just how much worse things might get if you don't prop the system up, however flawed it might be. The later unlockable characters do involve more advanced strategies. The Necromancer raises single hit point skeletons, which means having even more to coordinate at once. The Astral Walker can move through walls, which is useful in the right hands, but it's also easy to get them killed by leaving them stuck in walls when the ability runs out, or by accidentally running them off the edge of the map. Walls are such an important part of this game's strategy, to box in some characters and allow others to move independently. Triggering astral walking when you didn't want it can be a real problem. I don't have footage for the final unlockable character, but I believe they're a builder and put up protective walls. It seems a bit desperate when the council starts to run out of warriors and mages and starts to recruit tradespeople, but then it was already pretty desperate. I wonder how far can you push your people before they break, 